think we are good. I 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 think we are good. There's so many new things we I can do. I think we are good. I think we are good. I think we are good. Bring young Skywalker to me. No, bring him to me. No, bring him to me. Kermit the Frog here. Bring him to me, please. Bring him to me. Please. Bring him to me. Savvy. Bring him to me. Why can't I think of any more impressions? <laughs> <laughs> Josh! Hey, welcome back to our stupid reactions. You need some Corbin. I'm Rick. And you can follow us on Instagram, Instagram Twitter, 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 Ashoka's legacy. Ancient Decoding Ashoka's he's legacy. He's apparently one of the great uh, leaders in history. Like, mm, I was going to make a joke. But what? <laughs> Let's just say they're in the Republican Party. <laughs> hopefully not many, like, to, many to choose from. How, hopefully not like that. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, but this is like a... We've seen a couple. These are the animated things. Oh, I love these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, you know what I don't love about these? Mm. Is how many times... <laughs> People get upset with us for yeah. them not being accurate. Go, they have their own channel. Yeah, find them. Yeah. Hunt them down. <laughs> not me. We're just reacting. Here we go. Amidst the tens of thousands of monarchs that crowd the columns of history, the name of Ashoka shines and shines almost alone, a star. Ashoka is widely regarded as one of the greatest leaders in world history, ruling over a vast empire that encompassed most of the Indian subcontinent. We're told that he was an able conqueror, a commoner's advocate, a vigorous patron of Buddhism, and above all, a beacon of hope, that even the worst of us is capable of change. For, as the popular narrative goes, Ashoka was once a vicious and terrible man, predisposed to violence. But after the Kalinga War, he gazed upon the dead and repented, embracing peace and goodwill for all mankind. Today, more than 2,000 years after his death, Ashoka's legacy is alive and well. Two thousand. His years. lion pillar serves as the official emblem of India, and his chakra wheel appears in the flag. Oh, that's. But has Ashoka's legacy been whitewashed? I remember that. Examined closely, the historical record reveals a more nuanced figure, that of a deeply troubled authoritarian whose successes may have been limited. So let's evaluate Ashoka's legacy. Was he really as great as we've been told? Our story begins in 304 BCE, when Ashoka was born to Bindusara, emperor of the Mauryas and Subhadrangi, the royal hairdresser. According to various writings, Bindusara fell in love with Subhadrangi while she was cutting his hair, but he thought marriage was impossible due to her presumed low caste status. Not so fast. Subhadrangi was actually the daughter of a Brahmin family, thus opening the door to marriage. This is a great example of how records have been manipulated by ancient monarchs to suit their political goals. <laughs> while it's possible that this is a true story, it's more likely that Ashoka's mother was just a low caste hairdresser, her Brahmin background a well-crafted lie to legitimize the marriage. And so Ashoka may have felt as though he had something to prove. Once again, if any of this is inaccurate, do not get mad at us. His half-brother Tsushima was, and perhaps he perceived his mother's low birth as a contributing factor. As if that wasn't enough, Ashoka was not a handsome man. From the historical record, we know that he was short, pudgy, had a disfigured face, and suffered from a condition that made his skin rough. Kind of like Rick. In fact, Bindusara did not feel that Ashoka was a good fit for the throne on account of his ugly looks. But <laughs> Prince Ashoka was known Burn. as an intelligent, assertive, and a natural leader. And Bindusara could not ignore that. Impressed by these qualities, Bindusara used Ashoka as a tool to maintain the empire. Consider Takshila. Takshila was a frontier city of significant geopolitical, economic, and cultural importance. But it was crowded with migrant Greeks and Persians. As such, it teetered on the brink of open rebellion. When Takshila revolted, Bindusara sent Ashoka to quell the uprising. Though it's not clear how the rebellion was handled, we know that Ashoka successfully suppressed it. Ashoka returned to Patliputra victorious, and Bindusara rewarded him with a viceroy position in Ujjain. As Ashoka presided over Ujjain, he proved to be a competent leader. 
Some ministers in the royal court began to think that Ashoka might make for a better emperor than his half-brother, Tsushima. And so Ashoka realized that he had an opportunity to claim the throne for himself. In 272 BCE, Bindusara fell gravely ill. Ashoka rushed to Patliputra, the capital. Tsushima rushed back too, but he was late. Ashoka had already taken the city. <laughs> nope. Tsushima laid siege, but records indicate that he was captured and killed, possibly by Greek mercenaries employed by Ashoka. One writing indicates that Tsushima may have been thrown into a burning pit filled with charcoal. But Ashoka wasn't finished yet. For the next four years, Ashoka waged a civil war to consolidate power. He went on a rampage, killing several of his brothers with potential claims to the throne. Ashoka spared only his younger brother, Tissa. And so Ashoka was finally crowned emperor. For his regnal name, he chose to be called Priyadarshi, which, according to some translations, means he who is beautiful to look upon. Aww. Ironic, no? Before we evaluate Ashoka's rule, it's important to understand the popular narrative and its inconsistencies. As per the popular narrative, Ashoka was a cruel emperor who delighted in causing pain and suffering to others. <laughs> it was not until his conquest of Kalinga, a powerful coastal state, that Ashoka repented. We are told that when the Kalinga War ended, Ashoka looked upon the battlefield, seeing 100,000 dead, and realized the error of his ways. He converted to Buddhism <laughs> so at that moment and vowed to rule only by Dhamma. In other words, peacefully and through good conduct alone. From then on, we're told that Ashoka transformed into a magnanimous, kind emperor committed to the best interests of his subjects. Though theoretically possible, this transformation story should make you at least a little suspicious. Let's explore the facts. In the early years of his rule, Ashoka was known as Chandashoka, Ashoka the Terrible. Tales of Ashoka's cruelty are diverse and extensive, from burning alive women in his harem for implying that he was ugly, to building a special torture facility. He was very insecure Ashoka about his looks. Ashoka hired a psychopathic like royal executioner, most dictators. a man yeah. named Girika, to torture and execute prisoners in a special facility known as Ashoka's Hell. Hey, that looks like the it's Republican Party. Sorry. supported by the historical record. In fact, two Chinese monks, Fashian and Xuanzang, wrote about visiting the ruins of Ashoka's Hell many hundreds of years later. According to various writings, Ashoka liked to visit the facility for hours at a time to watch people be tortured. Oh. This begs the question, why would such a person repent after witnessing more suffering? I the popular know. narrative is ripe with even more inconsistencies. Translations of Ashoka's edicts reveal that he was a lay follower of Buddhism in his fourth regnal year. I like year, how he says not Buddhism. Devout. He became a more devoted Buddhist in his fifth regnal Buddhist. Year. Here's the rub. Ashoka I say Buddhist. Kalinga in his seventh Your wife. Year. Ashoka did not actually convert to Buddhism after the Buddhist War. He was already a practicing Buddhist before Buddhist. the war. That's the right way to say it. I know, I like it. <laughs> narrated by Ashoka's own edicts is almost certainly a politicized account of the Kalinga invasion. Ashoka even admits to manipulating the narrative in his very own edicts. He reveals that where two similar edicts are inconsistent in their language, it is due to political concerns. This is like they said 2,000 this years ago, right? Explain, yeah. for it's amazing how long people have been edicts, doing no stuff. <laughs> of the yeah. war, over 100,000 dead. How insignificant America is in the blimp of history. <laughs> The edicts in Kalinga itself do not contain any language referring to his repentance. There is no apology, no repentance to the people he actually killed. The repentance story exists only in edicts far from Kalinga. Fun fact, the repentance edicts also include a line indicating that while Ashoka had repented, he was willing and able to do to tribals and other problematic groups what he did to the people of Kalinga. One wonders, then, if the edict was meant as a threat as opposed to a true admission of regret. Ashoka cared a great deal about his image among his subjects. We know from his edicts that he would routinely travel in disguise among his subjects so as to learn the prevailing sentiment about him and his administration. Ashoka would therefore have been well aware that his image was deteriorating by the time of the Kalinga War. This was a man whose nickname had become Ashoka the Terrible. With the Kalinga War complete, he had little need or ability to push for an additional conquest. The empire was consolidated, and after losing several battles with the Tamil kingdoms in the deep south, Way to go, alliances Demo. had been struck to ensure <laughs> peace. And so Ashoka set about on a campaign of repairing his tattered image and ruling his consolidated kingdom. If only he had Rupert Murdoch. Repentance, devotion, peace, 
convenient story to put his concerns to rest. <laughs> and by indulging the popular narrative, it's possible that we've been buying into Ashoka's very own propaganda. Interestingly, Ashoka's propaganda didn't last for very long after his death. For example, just two generations later, a Kalinga leader, Karavela, attacked and took back the Jain idols that had been stolen by Ashoka. Karavela created his own rock edicts describing these exploits on a hill directly overlooking Ashoka's edicts. Symbolically, he avenged the destruction once wrought upon his own people. This evidence certainly weighs against the idea that Ashoka's near contemporaries believed in his peace-loving transformation. But I should be clear, Ashoka can still be considered a great emperor, even if he engaged in violence and propaganda and did not actually repent for his sins. Just how successful was he? Let's take a closer look. First, it's important not to underestimate the challenge of a 38-year reign, which was remarkably stable during his lifetime. Ashoka ruled over a vast and diverse empire, so this is quite an accomplishment. Stability at that scale always comes at a cost, however. Ashoka purchased the stability with a burdensome centralized bureaucracy and a heavy-handed administrative force known as the Dhamma Mahamatras. Essentially, they were a force of 81,000 government employees whose goal was broad, to go amongst the people and to ensure good citizenship, proper conduct and governance, and to intervene where necessary to promote positive outcomes. <coughs> they may have been well-intentioned, the Dhamma Mahamatras were rather invasive. They work among soldiers, chiefs, brahmins, householders, the poor and the aged, for their welfare and happiness. They work for the proper treatment of prisoners. They work in the women's quarters. They are occupied everywhere. The Dhamma Mahamatras conducted routine inspections of local government, courts, and the like. They were entitled to punish people for transgressions that violated some vague moral standard. They could even reward people for righteous conduct. Ashoka expanded the imperial bureaucracy substantially. This was not a meritocracy. Local bureaucrats were often chosen arbitrarily, selected from existing noble families or others with connections and money. This gave rise to a deeply corrupt regime at all levels. An expanded bureaucracy sucked up a significant portion of tax revenues. The Dhamma Mahamatras alone cost roughly 25% of total tax revenues to maintain. He had created a regime what a that shock. was <laughs> bound to crumble under the weight of its bureaucracy. It should come as no surprise that so many kingdoms declared their independence immediately after his death. For example, the Sakvahanas in the south and the Kalingas in the east. I like Let's the name Kalinga. Perhaps Ashoka's most obvious accomplishment lies in the religious realm. Ashoka was not only a practicing Buddhist, he Buddhist. also played a crucial role in the early spread of Buddhism throughout the subcontinent and beyond. Ashoka sent Buddhist missionaries to far off lands, from Egypt to Greece to Sri Lanka. For example, it's believed that Sri Lanka became Buddhist thanks to the missionizing monks sent by Ashoka. In the generations to come, Sri Lanka would serve as a launching point for Buddhist missionaries going to Southeast and East Asia. It's very likely that without Ashoka, Buddhism would not be a major world religion. Hmm. It's worth pointing out that Ashoka, at least as a matter of policy, attempted to create a religiously tolerant environment. His edicts indicate that he wanted his subjects to respect each other's religions and traditions. This may have been necessary given that the era involved significant conflict between religious sects. In fact, records indicate that Indian religious communities would sometimes come to blows after disagreements. No. But Ashoka what? seems to have acted inconsistently with his edicts. Various sources describe Ashoka as having ordered 18,000 Ajivakas killed. He did this in response to an offensive drawing of the Buddha, as depicted by an Ajivaka. This occurred after his supposed repentance. Sources describe another incident involving an offensive drawing depicting the Buddha, this time done by a Jain. Ashoka had the violator and his family locked in a house and burned alive. He then ordered Whoa. a bounty on the heads of all Jains, offering one silver coin for each Jain head that was brought to him. The violence did not stop until Ashoka's own brother, I'm not Tissa, convinced he repented. was accidentally killed as a result. <laughs> With respect to Hindus, it's worth noting that Ashoka banned many of the rituals, such as animal sacrifice, that would have been part of normal life for Hindus of that era. Hmm. Ashoka's many actions betray a rather significant bias in favor of Buddhism. All that being said, emperors are complex, and so too was Ashoka. He was a hard-working emperor who made himself available at all times of the day for reports and other important meetings. He was also reform-minded. In today's world, some of his policies would be considered quite progressive. He was not afraid to be heavy-handed. He made many legal reforms. 
For example, those who were sentenced to death were given time to appeal their case. Animal rights were That's also promoted. nice, I guess. <laughs> Wildlife preserves were created with state funds, and cruelty to animals was prohibited by law. Nice. According to his edicts, Ashoka believed that women had a right to be educated, and he made provisions for what? women to study in university. Today, it would be the equivalent of creating scholarships for the benefit of women. Emperors preceding Ashoka, such as Cyrus the Great of Persia, did the same, and may have influenced Ashoka in this regard. Ashoka also styled himself a builder. In his edicts, he writes about how he built many hospitals and roads, universities, water tanks, and irrigation systems. Okay, let's take a step back for just a moment. I'd like to address something that's really important when it comes to evaluating history. Relative success. See, when Ashoka talks about building hospitals and roads, universities and irrigation systems, we are told to accept this at face value as a resounding success of his administration. But if Tsushima had been emperor instead of Ashoka, would he not have built hospitals, roads, and universities? Ashoka ruled for 38 years as emperor. It would be ridiculous if he did not build new infrastructure. He did what an emperor is supposed to do, build and rule. But we have no reference point with which to measure his success. So why do we assume that his projects were effective? Consider recent archaeological excavations of the Mauryan period. They reveal that after Ashoka's death and after the collapse of the Mauryan Empire, the archaeological record becomes significantly more prosperous. There are improvements in material well-being in the generations after Ashoka's death. Whether this was due to a corrupt bureaucracy or a misguided economic policy, for example, the Mauryan focus on agricultural development and not on trade, we don't know. But Ashoka did not necessarily preside over a prosperous empire. Ashoka is a complex figure whose legacy is clearly mixed. In truth, his greatest accomplishment appears to have been religious. So why do we put Ashoka on a pedestal and ignore many other leaders in Indian history? It's quite simple, really. The political class that fought for Indian independence had to craft a story of a united India, a geographically, ethnically, linguistically, and religiously diverse country. In essence, a country full of countries. Ashoka ruled over the largest swath of land of any leader in Indian history. Conveniently, he was also a North Indian who followed a Dharmic religion, in line with modern India's political majority. In his edicts, he promotes religious tolerance and encourages tolerance of local traditions. Whether he lived up to those principles is a separate question. And so, if you're choosing a historical leader to represent India as a whole, Ashoka is uniquely well equipped, just so long as you stick to the sanitized version. And now you know. Shit. Are you are you guys taught about him in school? Ashoka? Oh really? That's interesting. I, I have you heard about him before? No. Yeah, I, I know that the wheel yeah, was yeah. connected to him. Yeah, yeah. But no, as far as I mean, it's not a surprise. We learned about Alexander the Great and we learned about, you know, everybody from the the the, the Western point of view of the conquerings. When mm -hmm. it comes to Asia as a whole, we are not taught much of anything Outside about any of, of the Asian um, leaders. What's it? Um, Attila, uh, Attila the Hun. The Hun, right? Mm -hmm. He's probably the biggest guy. Just in, because he was so barbaric. In that's Asia, it. Yeah, that's that we it. probably know about. That's it. Uh, I'd say... Uh, God, he didn't I, learn about any of the I dynasties in China. A little bit of Gandhi, essentially. That's it. Well, yeah, you don't learn a lot. You do learn Texas history, in case you want to know. Uh, that's a casual class. You know, they got to be careful who they show this to because there's a lot of people who, when they hear about how many things from uh, the past are telling stories that aren't accurate, they're going to go destroy all of the archaeological findings and say it's fake news. Yeah, it's true. So you got to keep uh, it away from those folk. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really interesting. Obviously, once again, if you think anything in here is incorrect, be mad. Say so. Yeah, but you don't you need can, to be mad. You can put in the comments what you think. And let us know Imagine why. Imagine if every teacher got mad at their students because they got something incorrect. A lot of teachers teach incorrect stuff because that's what the government requires you to teach. Yeah. The only time I got mad at a student is when they did well below what they ought to have done and they knew better. But if they were genuinely ignorant to something, what in the world would I get mad at them for? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, America in public schools uh, has a government-subsidized learning. And so... And also, there's a lot behind that as well. Yeah. In terms of the Dixiecrats and 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 the daughters of those people. Well, the, the Civil War. They got to 
make all the textbooks the mm -hmm. daughters of the Civil War people in the South. Uh, and so there's a reason uh, some of our history is a little uh, incorrect. Might history makes is written right. by the victors. Yeah, might makes right. And history is not only written by the victors, history is rewritten by the victors because they will take the things that were negative about them from the past and mm -hmm. obliterate them. If they have a conquering of a land that upheld beliefs that they didn't like, they will destroy everything N in its place. Native Americans. And erase it's from memory. Native American. Yeah. So, uh, black people. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a lot of America. Has it's ha I mean, it happens right now. I mean, we're watching stuff happen in America where if certain people get into power, they want to obliterate the reality of the past because it's no longer in alignment with what they believe. Yeah. So if they win, they get the right to do that because they got the power. It was a really interesting and well done video, obviously, once again information wise you guys can let us yeah. know where right. how accurate it is taking in this video we're not going to be like oh it was a blah 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 <laughs> yeah it was just an informational no, I video i don't walk out the door going i know everything i need to know about that subject <laughs> i'm gonna go teach everyone else the same thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't do that we don't do that but it was a well-made video uh, yeah. for sure uh, very engaging and, and also it was just to learn about uh somebody that i literally never heard of outside of we probably heard of of him in a few videos i'm sure um, especially with the wheel and the flag yeah, and its yeah, origins yeah. and some of the most important people in indian yeah. history yeah um but if you look at most uh old rulers even current rulers um where they're, they're all pretty 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 sketchy yeah where did when you indrani when you were learning about him where did he stand in terms of the great indians in indian history is he at the top Yeah? yeah, with many others, yeah, yeah, but yeah, there's yeah. no one more important for you to learn about when you talk about the history of India and its leaders. Yeah, because yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, a lot, a lot of you got a lot more. But that's the thing about you guys. A lot of kings. When you of... study Indian history, guys, you study millennia. We've got 200 years. <laughs> yeah, and they're all old white guys. Yeah, it's true. We are. Yeah. <laughs> True. It's true. It's so funny. It's like I was showing, especially here on the West Coast, because we expanded, obviously, from the east to the west. If you go to New York, there's a lot older things and they're a lot more European influenced. When you get to the west, this is the babiest part of this baby country. So when I drive around and show anything to Indrani, she's like, my city's older than your country. That's true. That is that's factually correct. Yep. And if you go to Hawaii, Much older. Uh, we stole that land as well. Um, just not. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Don't look up our history. It's not good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> I, I love Hawaii. Although, if you, if you go I, to Hawaii, I will but... say our beautiful uh, uh, Secretary of the Interior, who is Native American, she's the first Native American to get that position. Did you hear about them giving back tribal lands, sacred lands to a, a Native American tribe this week? No, I didn't. It, it, it happened. Oh, good. 400 and something acres of sacred land to this one particular tribe, which could very well be the first step in many as long as she is the one that's Secretary of Interior. I was so glad to see that. Yeah. America has stolen land. Let us know what you thought about the video. And uh, if there's any information that was incorrect, please just let us know what it is and get mad at them, not us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>